Welcome to Blind Abilities. This is Pete Lane. Well, let's, let's see how, how smart, smart we are today. Welcome to this edition of No, no Holes Bar. You're listening to the voice of Ted Galanos. I graduated with a degree in business administration, majoring in computer information systems. A proficient user of technology. I use the USB Darcy, which allows me to type with two switches, utilizing an expanded version of Morse code. With an active social media presence. I became a member of the Out of Sight community. They have all kinds of entertainment and fun on this chat site. Welcome to this edition of... Chain Reaction. I hunted around and found some tutorials for Goldway. The next month was nothing but Goldway. A self-taught audio producer. I started doing intros. They were very rudimentary and kind of poorly done right at first. But then I invested in some better equipment. You may have all you want, baby. But I got something you need. Taking on even more challenges with a new concept and business enterprise. Sighted folks, they take a lot of pictures and they put them in picture albums. Those of us in the blind community are kind of left out. Tammy and I got to talking about this concept, audio scrapbooking. But as is sometimes the case, we often measure our accomplishments against those barriers we overcame to achieve them. I was a very sickly baby, was not expected to live beyond about two to three years old. And Ted has overcome a lot. It's called osteomyelitis. The doctor then has to amputate. That is what has happened with portions of all ten digits of both hands and a couple of toes. And even more. The femoral platella ligament was torn. It made me go from being almost totally dependent on others to absolutely needing others. And how did he cope with the pitfalls? I've never been prone to depression. It was tough, but it taught me care. It gave me grit and made me the thicker-skinned person I am today. Join me as I chat with Ted Galanos. I learn from every experience I go through. And hear about how he has learned to adapt. I do have a lot of workarounds. I adapt and overcome has always been my mantra. The phone has just opened up a whole new world for me. You may be surprised. Or... I use my nose and other facial body parts to operate this thing. You may be amazed. Adapt and overcome. Hi folks, welcome to Blind Abilities. This is Pete Lane. Today I have a very special guest on the line with me. Ted Galanos hails from the great state of Texas. Ted, I want to say hey to you this afternoon and welcome you to the Blind Abilities podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well and thank you for having me on this show. I really enjoy listening to it and I'm honored and proud to be a part of this next episode. The honor is ours. I think over the next half hour to an hour or so, our audience is going to be absolutely enthralled with you and your story. Speaking of your story, Ted, normally we kick off with a question such as, tell us about your blindness. But in your situation, Ted, your medical situation spans far beyond blindness. Why don't you fill us in a little bit about your picture. Sure. I was born December 21st, 1973. I was adopted at birth, so I know nothing about my biological history. I was a very sickly baby and was not expected to live beyond about two to three years old, said the doctors at Texas Children's Hospital. When I was a baby, my mother wanted to get me shoes. The doctors said, you need to worry about grieving and not worry about shoes. And my mother said, well, if this boy is going to live even 20 minutes, he deserves to have shoes. So my mother has always been a supporter of mine all of my life. I was diagnosed at five years old with retinitis pigmentosa. I don't need to go into any explanation because I'm sure all of your listeners know what RP is all about. Early, early on, it was discovered that I had several other issues that deal with my hands and my feet. There is no known syndrome or disease or whatever. It's a compilation of symptoms, really. I have poor blood circulation, peripheral sensory neuropathy. That basically means I can't feel with my hands or feet. And I explain it to people in this way. The further you get from the core or the further away you get from the heart, the less sensation I have in my arms, legs, hands, feet, fingers, and toes. So having those two issues to deal with, I was able to easily injure myself 
whether it be catching the tip of my finger with a fish hook when I would go fishing or trying to microwave something in the microwave and something spills and it burns my hand, I don't notice it and it develops a skin tear or a blister or something like that. And so with poor blood circulation, I'm slow to heal with wounds. And over my lifetime, I have had to deal with innumerous infections. You can't avoid it. So my parents basically had to put band-aids on the tips of my fingers to protect and to cover up any existing wounds. I lived this way most all of my life. Well, you have enough infections in your fingers or any kind of a joint, the cartilage is going to begin to erode. And so bits of bone would start floating when you get infection that is not cured by oral antibiotics or intravenous antibiotics and the infection gets so bad it gets into the bone it's called osteomyelitis the doctor then has to amputate that is what has happened to me with portions of all 10 digits of both hands and a couple of toes my left heel has had some bone taken out of it i've had to deal with that i also have scoliosis i think because i use a wheelchair now and have been for years the scoliosis has really become prominent i was able to walk I was able to see for most of my childhood, well, all of my childhood. I only went totally blind about a year and a half or so after college. I used a scooter to get around campus and other things, one of the battery-operated wheelchair-like things. But when my sight went completely gone, then it was prudent that I used the manual wheelchair, not only just in the apartment or around my house, but everywhere. Don't need nothing but a good time. How can I so I'm assuming, Ted, that you attended mainstream schools through at least high school? I attended mainstream schools throughout my entire school career. From kindergarten to second grade, I was in a Montessori school. From third grade through seventh grade, I was in a parochial Lutheran school. Unfortunately, when you go to private schools, you don't have access to state agency help. I do recall getting some help when I was in seventh grade, and this was on the cusp of my parents' divorce. I think I might have had somebody come to the house. I think they brought me a talking clock. I think they brought me some independent living aids. It's hard for me to remember exactly what went on in that part of seventh grade because there was a lot going on with divorce and family Mm -hmm. issues. You did complete high school and you actually obtained a degree, did you not, in college? Where did you go to school in college? I first went to Tomball College, which is now called Lone Star Community College. We moved to Houston. My mother sold the property in Magnolia where I grew up. So I transferred to University of Houston downtown, not to be mistaken with University of Houston, the central campus. I started there in 95 and graduated in December of 2000 with a degree in business administration, majoring in computer information systems. So through grade school and high school, did you have full use of your legs? Were you ambulatory or did you have some sort of adaptive equipment for your disabilities throughout grade school and high school? I didn't have any adaptive aids from eighth grade to 12th grade, except I do remember there was a CCTV in the library, the high school library. I did receive orientation and mobility training from 8th grade through 12th grade, though I was very reluctant in using the cane at all because I wanted to depend on my vision. And because I didn't want the stigma of carrying a cane, I wanted to be as, quote, normal as possible. I rarely used my cane unless I knew that the O&M instructor was going to show up that day to take me out of class and walk around. Didn't want to get caught. (laughs) And I did get caught. I did get caught one day and I did get chastised for having the cane folded up inside my inside jacket pocket. (laughs) Begrudgingly, I did start using it a little bit more. I think we all go through that transition, that reluctance at some point or another. Because my vision in high school was not quite as good as it was in elementary, I did use various magnifiers that carry one in my pocket and use it to help supplement reading the large print textbooks that I actually did get. I finally got to use large print textbooks from eighth grade on. In high school, I started using the heavy ruled paper. I think that was provided either by the school or by the state. At that time, I still was able to see well enough to use ballpoint pen. 
And you still had enough dexterity and use of your hands yes, to write. Yes, I had enough dexterity to write until probably when I shifted to U of H downtown, where I relied less on handwritten notes and solely on cassette recorders. Did you take advantage during college of any disability services? I did. I did that in high school and in college. I would take extended timed tests and a couple of talking computers in the disabled student services office that I was able to use. The only computers I had was the one in my house provided by the state for college. That's the first time I ever touched a computer, in fact, was when I was preparing for going to college. So this was the mid-90s. What kind of screen reading software did you have on that computer? At that time, it was all DOS-based. So I used Vocalize, ZoomText for DOS, and the very first exposure to the Morse code concept using a handy code hardware software combination this hardware plugged into the serial port of the computer and had a two or three switch input i used three switches starting out when i was first getting trained on it but then my typematic rate was such that i was able to eliminate one of the switches and just type with two switches welcome to this edition of grab bag with your host Mary Kay. So throughout your schooling, obviously you had all these medical issues going on. How did you feel emotionally about this? How were you coping with this myriad of medical issues? Yes, I've never been prone to depression. I've fought against any form of depression throughout my life in dealing with what I deal with. I think that when I was in the five years of the Lutheran school, I was picked on in some cases, beaten up, and my sister tried to protect me in various ways she could, being two years younger and in a different grade, of course. It was tough, but I think it taught me character, it gave me grit, and made me the thicker-skinned person I am today. I learned from every experience I'd go through. And with a larger school population in public school, I was able to find people that I could fit in with. Interestingly enough, it was the blue collar type, headbanger, stoner, woodshop, auto mechanic kid that I got along with really well. Better than some of the more studious, I say upper class kids. They were the ones that tended to look down their noses at me. To say that I have a don't care attitude, it's not exactly accurate, but then again, it is. I don't sweat people pulling rank or pulling attitude, even in this nursing home where I live today. There's a lot of personalities and a lot of personality conflicts and problems. I just say to them, you're not going to run over me. I'm intelligent. I am educated and I speak eloquently and I get my point across that you do. And a lot of these people that work in this nursing home, I think are threatened by it. Speaking of nursing home, talk a little bit about the facility that you're in, how you got there, and fill our listeners in on your living situation. The whole reason why I'm in the nursing home to start with is that on August the 4th, 2012, I was transferring from the restroom to my wheelchair and my left foot got caught between the big wheel and the front wheel, the caster of the wheelchair. And I've done this transition hundreds of thousands of times over the 12 years I lived in my apartment. This one time, this freak accident, my foot did not come free of the place it was stuck in. And then not feeling my foot, I didn't know it. And then once you get to a certain point in your turn to sit in a chair, you kind of just plop right down. Well, When I plopped right down and let gravity take over from my foot to my ankle to my knee to my hip got wrenched and the femoral platella ligament, I didn't even know that ligament even existed, was torn. One late night went to stand up to go to the restroom and fell back in my chair. I thought, ooh, what's wrong here? Maybe I'm tired. Maybe I had one too many beers. I don't know. But (laughs) I sort of took a short nap in my wheelchair, regained my composure, and tried to stand up again. And this still didn't work. So I had a grab bar affixed to the wall beside my bed, and I thought, I need to grab this grab bar and stand up that way. I went to stand up, and I fell straight down. It was as if my left leg didn't exist anymore. Long story short, 
I was put in an ambulance, taken to the hospital, to a sniff unit at Concierge, couldn't stay there because they don't take Medicaid. So they decided you have to leave and find a place that takes Medicaid. I ended up at Woodridge because that's the place my father found. I wish that nobody had to live in a nursing home. And it's not just Woodridge, it's all nursing homes I've found to be true over the six years I've lived here. They're not a good place. I mean, there are nice people here, but there's also a lot of bad apples as well. And so six months out, the orthopedic doctor finally decided that it was time we could do surgery. He did surgery, he did reconstruction surgery, but it was done outpatient. I left here, went to the hospital, had the surgery done, came back here the very same day. In four days time, a CNA or certified nurse's assistant pulled both parts of my leg, my thigh and my calf, while it was in a knee immobilizer. She did not support both sides of it. And when I had to turn to have things taken care of, I felt a pop in my knee and basically that brand new ligament was detached yet again. In very short order, it got very badly infected. I had to go back to Memorial Harmon Hospital. They had to clean out the infection. I spent two and a half weeks on very strong IV antibiotics and then carried on with the IV antibiotics here for another month. Once I was stable, I went back to the doctor so he could note the progress of my healing. And I asked him, can we try to have this surgery again? He said, absolutely not. With your risk of infection, with your exposure to MRSA, no. No orthopedic surgeon worth his salt is going to ever touch my knee again because it's too high of a risk. He said, if it gets infected the same way a second time, it could very well be fatal. And so it made me go from being almost totally dependent on others for daily living care to absolutely needing others. Now that I cannot stand and transfer independently anymore was the whole reason why I had to be in a 24 hour type care facility. I don't need 24-hour around-the-clock care, but I need the availability of someone in the event... In the event of an emergency. Yes, yeah. exactly. Recognize me and punch me in the nose. He said, no more, Mr. Nice Guy. No more. Ted, let me hearken back to your transfer accident. As you were describing it, even that little bit of independence, your ability to stand up and transfer to a chair or wherever, having lost even that little bit of independence had to be just a huge loss. And I think our audience can certainly understand that. But I'd like to kind of get a real quick snapshot right now, if you're agreeable, of what your physical limitations are. So let me ask you a couple of quick questions. As far as the use of your legs, are you not able to use your legs to stand up at all? I'm gathering that one leg is completely useless. Do you have any ability to stand up at all? Not really. It's what physical therapists call minimal assist. In order to go to the restroom, we would, and by the way, these bathrooms are not ADA compliant, and I don't care what the employees and other people say, they're not accessible. Next question. Do you use a motorized wheelchair or do you have enough use of your arm to wheel the chair yourself? I've got enough use of my arms to roll the manual chair and I would not be allowed to have a power chair because they don't want to have a whole bunch of walls with holes. <laughs> Next question. You did say that you had some part of all 10 of your digits, your fingers and thumbs, amputated. Am I to assume then you have absolutely no fingertips with which to do anything? Correct. You, as well as the listening audience, can imagine you have three bones in each of the four fingers and two bones in your thumbs. Imagine the bone that's under your fingernail on all 10 digits, gone. And then the next bone, that's gone too. So you're left with only the bone that comes out of the palm of the hand. And in the case of my left hand, the ring finger is completely gone. And I jokingly say that I can never get married because there's no place to put the wedding band. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm quickly told that you can wear it around your neck on a chain. On a chain, sure. Or in your nose. What about your I nose? I was going to go there, too. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of noses, 
<laughs> My segues are shameless here. I want to tell our audience that, Ted, we are speaking on Skype and that you are using a PC Windows computer with great adeptness, by the way, and that you are absolutely computer literate. So why don't you talk about some of the workarounds that you had to contend with in order to master technology, given all those physical limitations? Okay, sure. I do have a lot of workarounds. I adapt and overcome has always been my mantra from the time I was very little to even today. With the computer, I now use Windows. I use Windows 10. I've got two laptops and a desktop computer that's behind me. I use the USB Darcy, which allows me to type with two switches, utilizing an expanded version of Morse code. I use JAWS for Windows. And so, yeah, if you would like me to demonstrate, Pete, I can pull up a notepad and the audience can hear sort of what it is that I type or how I That's a I great type. idea. Go okay. for it. So we have two buttons in front of me. One on the left is dot, on the right is dash. And incidentally, I was evaluated for this stuff at what is now called the Institute for Rehab and Research or Texas Institute for Rehab and Research or TIER in the Houston Medical Center. I got in touch with their technology lab. And since they knew that I was aspiring to go to college, that college professors don't take handwritten papers and we needed to devise a way for me to be able to type. It was ineffective for me to try to type on a normal QWERTY keyboard. I will open Windows and then open Notepad and I'll type a sentence. My chin is on the left button and it said E. The right button is T and that's done with my right thumb poised over the right button. Control Escape brings up the search box. I'll type NO because Notepad will pop up immediately. Okay, now I'll just type the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. E. 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 The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And there you have it. I typed a sentence in Notepad. And I can do this with email, Internet Explorer, or Google Chrome. I do this all day long with editing audio, like Pete's going to have to edit the audio for this podcast. Come and play Chain Reaction with Susie B. Every first and third. Tell us again how you navigated those buttons. In this case, I was using my chin for the left button and my thumb for the right button. Gotcha. When I could see, I could easily just sort of glance down and I could use my left and right hands both. Once I started losing my vision in all seriousness, I found that my hands would drift away from the buttons and I would not know it because I couldn't feel them drifting. <laughs> I adapt and overcome and don't really even realize I'm doing it with much thought. I just merely just put my left arm in my lap, leaned over and hit the button with my chin. And then in doing so, I realized with my chin over one button and my right thumb over the right button, my thumb is always grazing the right side of my chin. Your chin and your cheek, yeah. So it's a proximity thing. Right. So once I know my right hand is touching my cheek, it's going to hit that right button every time. I don't have to worry about my hands drifting and then causing me no end of frustration because when I'm typing, I'm trying to type quickly. And then if I start missing buttons, you can see where the frustration goes. Absolutely. So getting into the nitty gritty, you're positioned on a chair and your computer is on a table or a desk, I gather, right? Right. And your device is on the table in front of you. So you're actually leaning over, putting your head down and your chin down to reach the device on the table. That's correct. <laughs> Again, adapt and overcome. I use a lot of Velcro. Ah. Because if you didn't Velcro... It'd be sliding all over the place. Start sliding all over the place, exactly. So I've got a block of wood. Oh, I guess it's four inches by two inches by maybe an inch high. I guess it came from a two by four. Okay. And the buttons are Velcroed to the board. The board is Velcroed to the table. The reason for the board is it gives the buttons a bit more lift. I can hook my pinky finger against the board and my right hand won't go any further than the board. Kind of anchors it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, if none of this was affixed, you're right, it would be sliding everywhere and with me not having feeling, I could push it and use more strength than is necessary and it'll go all over the place. Right. Having said that, my wrist is right on the edge of the table. So when I talk to you about open wounds and stuff, that's a pressure point there. And it's been no end of trouble for me with my right wrist. 
I found just recently, I should have had this years ago, a mouse pad online on Amazon that has a wrist rest. And the maintenance guy here at Woodridge screwed the mouse pad to the table and it overhangs the edge of the table, I guess about three quarters of an inch. And it fits just perfectly. So my wrist is padded. The mouse pad stays affixed to the table and it doesn't go moving anywhere. And the buttons stay where they are. Wow. It works out really well. <laughs> An amazing technological breakthrough, the mouse pad, huh? <laughs> yeah. So what I'm wondering, Ted, is do you ever get a stiff neck and shoulders? I've been doing this for so long. As I said, I have scoliosis, and it's far more evident today than it was when I was first diagnosed as a two-year-old. And I think part of it is my horrible posture and having to work this equipment. No, I don't necessarily get much of a stiff neck. My shoulders do end up getting a little sore though. I would imagine you've developed the musculature in that area. It's pretty resilient. Ted, despite the day-to-day -day challenges that you have, you're still not content to sit around and let time pass by. Tell our audience a little bit about what additional things you do to keep yourself challenged. Well, I thought of myself as a shut-in for years because once I did lose my sight, I had to give up the keys to my scooter, which was a major tool of independence. I treated my scooter as a sighted person would treat their car, and I would literally drive it in the road. I would rarely be on sidewalks because the sidewalks weren't maintained as well, but I couldn't use that forever because I can't drive and be totally blind, right? So I was a shut-in for a while. I got involved with an outfit called Texas Adaptive Aquatics, which teaches disabled kids and adults how to water ski. And yes, you can water ski sitting down. I also got involved in that same time period in 2001 with a nonprofit called Turning Point. They do a whole lot of different adaptive sports for the disabled. They do hand cycling. They do kayaking. I would go on their black drum tournament where they take physically challenged kids and adults out fishing in the bay for black drum. The Texas Adaptive Aquatics Organization had created a wheelchair accessible hunting edition called Texas Adaptive Outdoorsman. And I told Roger, the president of TAA, I want to do some hunting too, but there's no way in the world I can shoot a shotgun. So he looked around and found an outfit out of Somerville, Texas. And through donations and grants, he bought some equipment. It started out with a laser. And now we use a camera and there's a mount that attaches to the wheelchair that holds the gun for me. The laser or the camera looked downrange. And I have a trigger pull hook-like thing that's taped to my hand. Roger looks at the laser beam and where it's pointing on the animal, or he looks through the LED screen that's attached to the camera, and he guides the front of the rifle to where it needs to go. I hook the trigger pull into the trigger, and I shoot the deer that comes to the feeder. That's the physically challenged deer hunt I go on once a year. And have you bagged some bucks? No, this is what they call a meat hunt. And due to certain laws in Texas, they don't want to have any risk of hunters shooting an illegal buck due to inexperience or whatever. So we are only allowed to shoot doe. And Texas Parks and Wildlife give us a certain number of tags to use for this event. The first year I went on it, I got two within about seven minutes of daybreak. No kidding. <laughs> the next wow. year I came up dry. So those are my three outdoor activities that I love to do. Now, before we move into your other indoor activities, talk about what you do in a more mundane routine type of an outing, because we do have some audio clips that you've provided to me, which are a recording of you taking an outing with your mom during Thanksgiving. So talk about how often you get out of Woodridge and what types of things do you do? Well, the one you're speaking of is when mom and I went to Thanksgiving the morning before, I call Metro Lift. That's what we call our paratransit in Houston. Made reservations to go to the restaurant. Mom came up to Woodridge. This is November 22nd, Thanksgiving morning. My mother and I are about to get on Metro Lift and go out to eat. We're getting on a Metro Lift bus or, yes, uh, or a yellow cab? Getting on a van. Can I get you his ID and his ticket? You having a good Thanksgiving? So far, so good. Good. 
Ah, somebody who likes Queen. Classic rock. Uh, what, you got some Queen on right now? I don't, you do. <laughs> I hear it in the stereo of the vehicle. Another one bites the dust. Get your brakes. And another one down. Went to the restaurant, had a meal. Hey guys, welcome to the classic. My name is Carrie. I'm going to be taking great care of you guys today. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you, sir. Thank you. And we will have drinks. Yeah. All right, what can I get for y'all? I'll have the tiki. It's sort of growing on me. It's got rosemary in it, and I'm not sure I like rosemary. I don't think I would want rosemary in a drink. It has a lot of the flavor properties of cough syrup. Of cough syrup? Like rubber cough syrup? Strange. That's what I would most associate it with, is rubber cough syrup. <laughs> and that's never good. Other things that... I have recently gotten involved in, in the last, a little bit less than a year, is Houston Council of the Blind. I knew it existed, but I never got involved in the local politics of ACB, NFB. I knew they existed, but it just wasn't my shtick. But because I wanted to go to the ACB National Convention last summer in St. Louis, I decided, you know, I better try to make a half-hearted effort to see what this program is about and start educating myself. And I got to where I liked going to it because it actually gets me out of this building and back into society again. Whereas I was more of a shut in and some people would even call me a hermit for a number of years, except for my online outlet and socialization through the computer. Through the computer is certainly not the same as socializing in person. I've grown to re-understand that. Welcome to this week's Password Christmas Edition. <laughs> Getting involved with HCD, Houston Council of the Blind, and coupled with friends on Out of Sight, the voice chat network, I was challenged by a friend to get an iPhone. Well, all I had was a little government throwdown phone that Woodridge provided that I couldn't really use. I mean, I could get phone calls and fortunately had Bluetooth. So my little Bluetooth earpiece, I can say answer or ignore, but I couldn't make phone calls out. So Bruce Stockler, a good friend of mine said, Ted, you can do this. You can do this with your notes. No, I can't. I've known friends who've had iPhones for years with Siri and the talk back and all that, but I couldn't see myself using it. And so Bruce said, well, if I can play Dice World with my nose, then you need to look into this. And he did. He played Dice World with his nose. And I thought, you know what? He's got something there. I did some research. I found a program called STAP, or Specialized Telecommunications Assistance Program, which aids people that are blind and upper mobility impaired and helps them to get communications devices. I got a voucher for $649, and I've got myself a nice little iPhone 7. I thought, well, how in the world am I going to use this? Another close friend of mine, Tammy Lynn, an assistive technology instructor in Minnesota, started helping me over Skype. She's so sweet. She brags on me, saying that I learned more in one week about the iPhone than a lot of her students learn in two months. The Houston Council also recommended that I get in touch with iBugToday.com. iBugToday.com is our Houston version of, I think, Pete, it's called iAccess there in Jacksonville. Right. And iBug stands for Blind Users Group for the iPhone and iDevice. I found out how to dial into their meetings, and I dialed into a few meetings late last spring when I first got my phone. I thought, you know what? This isn't cutting it. If this is local, I'm going to go there. So I bought myself some more Metrolift tickets. And now, <laughs> if I want to go somewhere, I call Metrolift, make my reservations. I get from here to the front of the building. I get on the Metrolift, and I go to wherever I want to go. The phone has just opened up a whole new world for me. That's incredible, Ted. What a story that is. So you operate the phone with your nose. That is correct. Using voiceover. Using voiceover. I'll do a Hey Siri quite a bit, but my... And as you just heard it, it reacts. There you go. <laughs> yes, I use my nose and other facial body parts to operate this thing. 
Let me pause here a moment, Ted. Tell us how you do the two-finger double tap, otherwise known as the magic tap. I use my nose and my upper lip to do the two-finger double tap. I'm not sure who this is. Why don't you go ahead and answer it for our audience? Hello? Hold on one second if you can hear me. I can hear you. I had to use my forehead to do the proximity sensor so it would go to speakerphone. Okay, I don't recognize the phone number. Who am I talking to? No problem. This is Richie with Script Talk. Russ Davis wanted me to give you a call. Ah, wow. Friday night and I need a bike. My motorcycle and a switchblade knife. My hand full of grease and my hair feels right. But what I need to make me tired of those girls, girls, girls. All right, so I got the iPhone and I use my nose my upper lip, and in some cases, lower lip and chin. Gives a whole new meaning to FaceTime, doesn't it? Ah. You know, to hit the home button, I use my upper lip to hit the home button, assuming I'm holding the phone. Oh, and by the way, this is something else that might be good to note. I have my phone on a leash. In fact, it's a lanyard. If I'm not, like, sitting in the bed or if I know that I'm going to leave the tabletop, and go somewhere else in the building or out and about. It has a four loop lanyard that goes over the four corners and then it's looped around my neck. And so I will grab the two ends of the loop that's around my neck into my fingers and between my teeth and my fingers, I will get the phone sort of in the palm of my hand and then I'll manipulate it such that both hands are on either side of the phone because I can't hold it, but I can hold it, right? And so then I rest the home button side of the phone against my chin when I'm out and about and don't have a tabletop to put the phone on. And I use my nose and upper lip to wrench my neck to do the rotor. And then to turn on the lock screen, I kind of fumble with it to get it on its edge and use my tooth. Your tooth. Your tooth as in T-O-O-T-H. Yes, to push the lock button or the volume controls on the other side of the phone. So I use all parts of my face to operate the phone. So essentially, you're only cradling the phone with your hands. Yes. And then all of the motion, the gesture movements, the swipes, the flicks, the touches, the double touches are all done with various parts of your face, head, mouth, and teeth. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Ted, I just have to pause here a moment and just marvel. You're a remarkable guy. Welcome to a haunted day of fear, 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 fear. With your host, the Wicked Witch. Talk about your audio production and work. Okay, yeah, this is something that, oh, I guess about four years or so ago, not long after I started going to Out of Sight and becoming a member and getting involved, one of my friends on there, TJ, had an intro done for one of the nighttime games we play. Let me interrupt. Do a 20, 30 second setup about Out of Sight. Well, in being a shut-in, back in 2005, got involved with an online accessible gaming website called All In Play. Through All In Play, I heard them talking about FTP, For The People. For The People was a voice chat community. Well, over the years, other newer chat sites came about. And over the course of the next, oh, I guess 15 years or so, we bounced from, I say we because there's a number of us that did this, bounced from one chat site to another, landing on out of site, out dash of dash site dot net. So I became a member of the out of site community about four years ago. On out of site, they have different games they play, word games, trivia games, music games, dice games. They have all kinds of entertainment and fun to be had on this chat site. One of the games on there is five category trivia. When I first started going there, Rich Desteno had an intro for his game. He was the only one to have an intro for his game. And my friend TJ was the one who created it. And I thought, you know what, I could do that. So about three and a half years or so ago, I hunted around and found some tutorials for Gold Wave. And for the next probably month, just was nothing but Gold Wave. So I started doing intros for other games that went on. And they were very rudimentary and 
kind of poorly done right at first. But then I invested in some better equipment, a Shure microphone that I'm speaking to you on now, a audio interface that plugs into the USB port, kind of what I call a external sound card meets really tiny audio mixer. My intros started getting better. Welcome to your favorite quiz show, Graphic Fire Trivia. I also wanted to start participating in a talent type show on Out of Sight on Saturdays called On Stage. And that's where I got into trying my hand at karaoke singing. Again, it was very rudimentary early on, but When you work at something long enough, and especially if you're self-taught, in my opinion, you really learn your software, you really learn the tools of your trade. You don't necessarily need formal education to learn. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. In doing the intros and stuff, I was asked to put together a memorial of our late friend, Victor Chan. I used one of the vocalizer voices to read a kind of biography that was in one of the newsletters back in time, and then I backed that to some musical pieces. What we're going to do first is have my sound engineer, Teddy, play a recording of the interview that was done in December 2014. Out of Sight News and Views, issue number 24, December 1st, 2014. Member Spotlight, by Karen Santiago. The Spotlight is traveling 2,826 miles from the East Coast, Brooklyn, New York, to the West Coast, Sacramento, California, to shine ever so brightly upon Victor Chan. Well, I did such a good job with putting that together, and the memorial turned out really nice. Karen Santiago approached me and asked if I could turn their text of the blindperspective.com newsletter into an audio format. She liked it. Welcome to the Blind Perspective. Logo description, a view from a window with lavender curtains drawn back viewing the snowy peaks of a mountain range. The words, the Blind Perspective hover above in the sky. Doing that gave our friend Tammy Lynn this idea of audio scrapbooking. I thought, wow, audio scrapbooking. She wanted to have a scrapbook, an audio scrapbook for her daughter. Sighted folks during the holidays take a lot of pictures, and they put them in picture albums, and they bring them out at family gatherings. So those of us in the blind community are kind of left behind. Tammy and I got to talking about this concept. She took cassette recordings that go back 25 years, got a cassette to USB recorder from Amazon, started recording literally hundreds of hours of cassette audio from the time before her daughter was born up to very recently when she graduated from nursing school from the Navy. And so I've got this whole pile of cassette recordings and then various musical pieces that backed up certain parts of the timeline. And then, of course, Tammy recorded herself speaking throughout. It turned into about 30 or 31 minutes of audio. And now Tammy can put it on a thumb drive and take it to someone's computer and play it, or she can transfer it to somebody's Victor and play that, even on her phone. What a great idea audio scrapbooking is. Very cool concept, yes. Are you now in the business of doing audio scrapbooks? And if so, do you want to let our audience know to reach out and contact you if they have any interest? Absolutely. I want to say that it's still a concept, not a business. I don't have a DBA. I don't have a tax ID. In fact... I'm not sure I'm even allowed to have anything like that living in a nursing home, and I certainly don't want to put my Medicaid and all that in jeopardy. But contributions or donations are certainly the key to circumvent any kind of problems with my medical insurance. In a manner of speaking, yes, I want to parlay this into hopefully a business in the future. I have created a Gmail account specific for this blind audio scrapbooks at gmail.com b-l-i-n-d-a-u-d-i-o scrapbooks s-c-r-a-p-b-o-o-k-s at gmail.com great 
Good stuff, Ted. Yeah, it's a wonderful concept. I've tried my hand at that. To Sir Tom, when I was losing my sight, you gave me the strength to stay in the fight. In order to see if I could be able to go backstage, I created an email explained my name is Cheryl Spencer I'm totally blind I've met Sir Tom in the past and he has always said whenever I see his name that I could come and say hello that I have been a fan club president of his for 15 plus years and I would like a minute of Tom's time. So Saturday morning, there is a reply. Dear Cheryl, we will happily arrange a meet with you and Sir Tom. Well, when I heard that, I just pulled my headset off and just started crying. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It really meant a lot to me. Had a great time doing it. We wish you a lot of luck with that. With, with your, your hosts, Sharon <laughs> and Cheryl. Ted, we ask our Blind Abilities guests a pretty standard question. What advice would you give to a blind teenager who is transitioning from high school, either onto college or into the workplace? My advice is don't let the world get you down. There's going to be disappointments in life, major and minor. But if you keep your nose pointed in the right direction and you have a good attitude and you're ambitious, that's the key, ambition. And take pride in what you do. If you find a niche, go after it. Make it an achievement, an accomplishment. Living in a nursing home, there's a lot of employees here that ought not be here because they come to work with a chip on their shoulder. They come to work rather not wanting to be here. Sadly, in little nitpicky ways, they take it out on the resident. And that tells me they don't have pride in their craft. They don't have ambition. You as a blind or disabled or wheelchair bound or all of the above individual listening to this podcast, it's even harder for you because you are disabled and already a minority. My advice is go that extra mile. Be that much more ambitious. Don't keep your eye on the ball. Keep your nose pointed in the right direction. Or in your case, on the iPhone screen. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And above all, adapt and overcome, right, Ted? Exactly. Adapt and overcome. Right on, dude. We've been speaking with Ted Galanos. Ted has a remarkable story, and I am absolutely positive, Ted, that our audience has benefited from hearing your stories, all of your challenges, and all of your adaptations and barriers which you've had to overcome in your lifetime. You are truly inspirational. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for having me on. Again, our pleasure, Ted. You have a great day, and we will talk to you soon, my friend. Excellent. My name is Ted, T-E-D, Galanos, G-A-L-A-N-O-S. My email address is tr.galanos at gmail.com. I can be reached through Skype. My Skype ID is tedster1, that's T-E-D-S-T-E-R, and the number one. I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter. This concludes my chat with Ted Galanos. I certainly hope that Ted's story will be in some way motivational to you and perhaps even inspiring. Once again, the theme that we often present on blind abilities is one of achievement, one of accomplishment, and we often measure those accomplishments against the barriers and the challenges that our guests have overcome to achieve them. Clearly, Ted has had a myriad of significant challenges over his lifetime. We applaud Ted on his grit and wish him all the best as he moves into the future. I'm sure we'll see further accomplishments from our guest, Ted Galanos. For more podcasts with the blindness perspective, you can find us on the web at www.blindabilities.com. Download our app free from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. We're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.